ahead and be seated if you would, please. Well, that's a happy song, right? Makes me H-A-P-P-Y to just say hallelujah. By the way, do you know how you say hallelujah in Spanish? Is hallelujah. You know how to say hallelujah in French? Is hallelujah. So you speak many languages now, and you didn't even realize it. I want to share a quote with you that I heard recently about worship. We're here for a worship service. We're here for a worship service. And so let me share with you, uh, if y'all will go ahead and have a seat, let me share with you a, a statement about worship. We, uh, we gather on Sundays and we have this time of worship, but what is that? What are we doing? Listen to this. This, this is a statement by a very famous Christian author and pastor named Eugene Peterson. Just listen to this statement. Worship is the strategy by which we interrupt our preoccupation with ourselves and attend to the presence of God. Let me read that again. This is, this is, a, this is an amazing insight. Worship is the strategy by which we interrupt our preoccupation with ourselves. We, we can be so wrapped up in ourselves, right? Somebody said, if you're all wrapped up in yourself, you're wrapped up in a pretty small package. <laughs> so we interrupt that, our preoccupation with ourselves, and we attend to the presence of God. And so we're aware of each other. I'm certainly glad you're here. I'm aware of your presence today. And you're aware of the presence of those on the platform, and, and that's good. But our primary attention needs to be with the presence of God in this service today. Amen? And so let me just, let me just draw us together, focus our attention, gather our hearts together. And I want to begin the service today by doing something a bit different, but I think it could be a, a very important, meaningful moment uh, if you're like me, you've been very concerned with the events unfolding in the Ukraine. Uh, we have a number of brother, thousands of brothers and sisters in Christ in the Ukraine. You may not realize that we have a Baptist seminary in the Ukraine, in Odessa. And uh, it's been a shelter for refugees in recent days, and it's, it's under attack. And uh, this morning, driving in this morning... Uh, we heard on the radio two Americans were killed in, in the Ukraine uh, in the last 24 hours. Uh, one was a, a, two, they were two American journalists. And so th this, is, this is serious business. And we, we really need to be uh, supporting our allies and our brothers and sisters in Christ in the Ukraine. So I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to join me here at the front and kneel here at the front for a time of prayer for the Ukraine. Right now, if you would, I'm going to ask many of you, if you'd stand, if you're physically able, come on up here to the front. And I just want us to very much focus this morning and ask the Lord to have mercy and grace as we lift up. The, the, this is our family. This is our, our Christian family. And so I want us to begin our service today as we do this, please. Let's interrupt our preoccupation with ourselves and lift up the desperate need of people that are just like us, except they live on the other side of the world. They speak a different language, but they know Jesus. And so let's interrupt our preoccupation with ourselves this morning. How about if we do that? And let's lift up the needs of these and go before our Lord. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we are desperate for you. We're desperate for you to move and work in our world today. A world you created, a world that you love, a world for which Jesus came and died, and a world that is badly broken. And Lord, too often we pray for things that would make our life happier we pray for things that would make our life more comfortable. 
But Lord, we want to pray today for things that do not even directly affect us, but are at your very heart. Your children, the holiness, the shelter of your children in the Ukraine that have done nothing to bring this about that want to love their families, that want to love their children, want to love their grandchildren, want to live in peace with their neighbors, and their world is being terribly threatened, and the freedom of religion is under attack in that sovereign nation. And so, Lord, not politically, not for political gain. That's not why we come today. We come in the name of Jesus. We come, Lord, as your children, begging you to take care of other children of yours, that are our brothers and sisters in Christ. They call you Father like we do. And we pray, Lord, that you'll take care of them, that you'll have mercy on them, and we pray you'll strengthen them. We, we are thrilled to hear the reports of those that are sharing the gospel, even with their enemies, of enemies that are turning to Christ because of the witness of these people. And so, Lord, give them courage to withstand tremendous difficulty and persecution, Some, uh, unlike anything we know. In fact, we're even embarrassed to think about the things that trouble us when we think about what they're facing. So Lord, today we're interrupting our preoccupation with ourselves. We're asking you on behalf of these, our friends, our family in Christ, God, take care of them. God, have mercy. And Lord, you tell us that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And so Lord, I pray that you would do whatever is necessary to sway the hearts of world leaders, even someone that we don't understand his actions, like Putin. Lord, we pray that you'll do something. Be as gentle as you can and be as severe as you have to be to work in this man's life, to stem the tide of evil, uh, something that's just unnecessary. And then we pray for world leaders that are trying to, to learn how to respond. And we don't know the answer, but Lord, you do. And so we pray they'll turn to you and have wisdom and courage to do what is right in your eyes. And so, Lord, forgive us for pettiness. Forgive us for being small. Forgive us for thinking of ourselves. And deliver us from that today, even as we begin this service, to focus on you today now, Lord. And we pray henceforth as we go into this service that we'll lift you up, that we'll be thinking about you. We won't be thinking about the temperature in this room. We won't be thinking about the distractions of this week. We'll be thinking about you, focus on you, and eager for you to touch us and change us and transform us in this hour. Because you say that if you be lifted up, you'll draw us unto yourself. So do that today, Father. Be with every aspect of this service. And may we see and hear in the days to come your goodness and grace being poured out in this place and around this world so that we someday, all nations, will be able to bow before you and say, worthy is the Lamb who was slain and lives. So we ask it, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus and for his sake we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You return to your seat. Let's worship the Lord together now. Let's worship him. Can't think of a better song to start this worship with. Who is like the Lord?
The great 
I don't know if you're familiar with that song. I love that song. Three months ago today, we sang that song at the funeral service for my sister. It was Monday, December the 13th, and we were singing about looking off yonder into glory when the Lord calls our name. And when He calls your name, if you know the Lord, you will rise. You will meet Him. If you do not know the Lord, that's not going to be a, a good day. That's going to be an awful day. And yet the good thing is, for those of us that do know Jesus, you don't have to wait until that day to worship Him. Don't wait. Somebody said if we wait and we don't worship down here, the rapture is going to be a rupture to us when we get up there. So let's learn to worship now. Amen? Let's, th this is dress rehearsal, all right? So today, as we worship, let's, let's interrupt our preoccupation with ourselves. Amen. And let's attend to the presence of God and do that as we worship in giving, being grateful for what God has given to you. Let's do that right now. Lord, we want to attend to your presence. You're here right now. You're here. You're watching. You're observing. You're evaluating your children in this place. So God, help us to not embarrass you. Help us to not make you uh, sad by the way we worship. Help us to give you our best, to interrupt our preoccupation with our pettiness and ourselves, and to attend to your presence right now. And so Lord, as we give, as we pray, as your word is proclaimed in our hearing, help us to surrender to you and transform us God, I'm asking you to do that. I've studied and I've prepared and I've prayed, but all I can do is proclaim your word. Lord, I need you to impart your word into lives. So please do that, Father. And we pray that even as we begin to approach the invitation, we'll be getting ready, we'll be prepared to say yes to you at the highlight, climax of today's service as we worship you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. a dear friend, brother in Christ, who uh, went through a very difficult season, so difficult that his son, the preacher's son, took his life, committed suicide. And the preacher took some time to be with his family, he was out of the pulpit for several weeks, and went through a very dark time. And when he came back to the pulpit, he said, thank you for praying for me, thank you for praying for your pastor. Here's what he said. He said, in the last few weeks, I hit rock bottom. He said, but I'm happy to report that when I hit rock bottom, it was solid rock. Amen? 
And so as we go through trials, don't waste your sorrows. Don't waste your struggles. I read a book years ago. That was the name of the book, Don't Waste Your Sorrows. Because God can teach us and conform us and, 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 and uh, uh, mold us into the image of God uh, through problems. Sometimes He does it through people. Somebody said, you know, who, you know what people are? People are heavenly sandpaper to smooth off rough edges in our lives. Amen? You say, yeah, I know some coarse grade, triple O uh, sandpaper. But God is our solid rock. Amen? How y'all doing this morning? Y'all good? You ready to worship and listen to God's word? Amen. Well, you're going to. So here it comes. Romans chapter 14. If you'd be finding Romans, the 14th chapter, we've been in our journey through the one another's in the Bible, and I'm planning to conclude that series next Sunday. Next Sunday will be my final sermon in that series, and then we'll be going into Easter. Now, I said it'll be my final sermon in that series. I didn't say it'd be my last sermon, right? Somebody said, hey, did you hear the preacher's last sermon? Somebody said, I hope so. And uh, so next Sunday we'll conclude our series in the one another's. I hope it's been good for you. It's been good for me. I pray it's been good for our church. And so this morning as we come out of it, uh, this is sort of on an upswing this morning. It's what we're going to look at. And the message this morning is we are to build up one another. Build up one another. You see the upward spiral there. And the passage we're going to consider is just one verse today. Romans chapter 14 and verse 19. It says, So then, we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. What, a, what an incredible statement. And it's based upon all that has gone before in the book of Romans, Romans is some of the best theology, best teaching, best doctrine uh, in Scripture. Do you know what doctrine is? I'm going back to Arkansas next week to see the children. Somebody asked an Arkansas pastor, Pastor, what is doctrine? He said, doctrine, that's what sick folks need. They need doctrine, right? Well, to be spiritually healthy, we need doctrine. We need to be fed and taught on the Word of God. And so Romans is a book of teaching. It's, it's to make us healthy. And he comes to verse 19 and he says, So then, based upon everything that we know, pursue the things that make for peace and the building up of one another. Now, let me just point out to you, uh, most of us, just being real honest here, most of us know more than we're doing. We know more than we're practicing. And so just to know things, just to accumulate knowledge uh, in, in computer language, just to have information download, that doesn't mean that it's affected your life. Some of the godliest, sweetest people I know are church folks. And some of the honoriest people I've met are church folks. So just because you know something doesn't mean that it's affected you. And so the Bible says, so then, based upon all of this, here's what we do. We put it into practice. I had a student ask me this week a very perceptive question. Sometimes students' question is, is this going to be on the exam? But I had a student ask me a great question this week. It's a preaching class that I teach called pastoral preaching. And the student said, Dr. Talbert, what is the difference between teaching and preaching? I said, that is a very insightful question. And it's not volume. It's not just that preachers yell and get louder. That's not the difference. Now, we may get louder, but the basic difference between teaching and preaching is application. It's putting into practice what you know. Now, teachers, many of you teach the Bible and teach Sunday school or Bible studies, and I'm, I'm sure at some point you talk about what we ought to do, but many times teaching is just digging into the text, seeing what the text says, seeing what the Apostle Paul wrote or what the Romans were doing and, and unloading, un, sort of unpacking that. And sometimes we can leave without thinking about, so what? So what do I do about this? Preaching, that's what Paul's doing here, is application. He's saying, so then, we run after, that's what the word pursue means. We run after some things. And what are those things? Look at it. So then we pursue 
the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. And there's our building up phrase. We're to pursue. We are to actively run after things that will make for peace. Peace is not automatic. Peace is sometimes a rare commodity in our lives. This conflict that's going on in the Ukraine right now, did you know there are seven other conflicts going on in the world right now? Apparently the media just doesn't care to talk about those. And so wars and conflicts are a part of our broken world. And conflicts and misunderstandings are a part of our lives. Jesus made this statement. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. He said, but take courage because I have overcome the world. So we cannot avoid conflict and strife, but we don't have to succumb to it. We don't have to be like the guy, somebody said, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing pretty good under the circumstances. Well, what are you doing under there? Don't live under the circumstances. Don't be the, the casualty of life and what others do. Jesus said, in this world you're going to have tribulation, but take courage, I've overcome the world. Jesus was mistreated like none of us. The writer of Hebrews says, you and I have not resisted to the point of the shedding of blood. And so Jesus overcame this world, even though this world took him to the cross and, and mistreated him horribly. Jesus said, I've overcome that. I've overcome, I've fulfilled the will of my Father. And so this morning, I just want to talk about things that we need to do to pursue peace, to run after peace, to um, not take it just casually, to be intentional about it. Um, I had something fun happen last week. I, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. I'm, not, I'm just telling you, not bragging. Joy and I tithe to Hebron Baptist Church. Now, I should say Joy tithes to Hebron Baptist Church because she writes the checks in our family. <laughs> Amen. And so Joy fills out our tithe check once a month, and we turn in our tithe check once a month at Hebron Baptist Church, right? And we usually do, do it on the first Sunday of the month. And so last Sunday, I had the offertory prayer, and I came down the steps, and, and the usher started taking up the offering, and Joy was holding our tithe check, and she's waving it like this. And I noticed the usher, he, he didn't mean, he, he just overlooked Joy. And so I thought, well, I could have said, well, good, I, I, I don't have to give today. You know what I did? I chased him down. I did. I chased the usher down and said, would you please take my tithe check? And it was just fun. He and I laughed about it later. But the point is, I chased him down. I was pursuing. I was intentional. I wanted to do that. I didn't think, well, I just got out of that one. No, 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 I pursued him. Peace is something we're to pursue. Peace is not something that if it happens, it happens, and if it doesn't happen, it's not my fault. No, we're to pursue the things that make for peace. So let's just think about that today. Just some simple things here uh, about building up one another. The first thing I would say to you is we're to do this because God is the God of peace. God is the God of peace. If anyone ought to have a right to be offended, it ought to be God because we've offended Him. I said, we've offended Him. We're sinners. We're broken. God's holy. God created us. Put us in a perfect world. Put Adam and Eve in a perfect environment. I mean, it was almost like the Garden of Eden. <laughs> and, they, and they rebelled against God. And, 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 and we do the same thing. If anybody ought to have a reason to be offended, it ought to be God because we've offended Him. But here's what the Bible tells us. God's the God of peace. And God saw to it to pursue us in order to make peace with us. And he didn't do anything wrong. We're the ones that offended him, but he pursued us. He went looking for Adam in the garden, seeking the Adam out. Said, Adam, where are you? God hadn't lost Adam. He hadn't misplaced Adam. He knew right where Adam was. He wanted Adam to know where he was, and that was that he was separated from God. And so God's a God of peace. God is the God of peace. To the church in Philippians, here's what, here's what Paul said about our practice of life, our, our, our application. Listen to this. Jot down somewhere, Philippians 4, 9. Write that down in your notes. Philippians 4, 9. The things that you have learned 
and received and heard and seen in me practice these things. There it is. Same thing he said here in Romans uh, 14, 19. The things you know, the things you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. I mean, if you were to come up to me at the end of the service today and say, good sermon, Brother Mark, I'd, I'd say thank you. But a, a good question for, would be for me to ask you, so what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? That's what Paul says here. The things that you've heard and seen and received in me, practice these things, listen, and the God of peace will be with you. Would you like to have more peace in your life? Would you like to have more peace in your life? This is the audience participation part of the message. Would you like to have more peace in your life? Well, here it is, Philippians 4, 9. The things that you've heard and learned and received, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. You're welcome. God's the God of peace. Jesus said, John 14, 27. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace, Jesus said, I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Don't go around expecting the world to make your life peaceful. The world is going to disrupt you. You're, you're thinking everybody in your life ought to be doing things to make you happy. And, but guess what? They think your job is to make them happy. And so we miss each other. We just miss each other's bat all the time. You remember Bill and Gloria Gaither, the Gaithers, the Gaither Trio, the Gaither Vocal Band, all those folks? On one of their early albums, they, uh, they were having a family picnic, and they were getting lunch ready, and Benji at that time was a little four-year-old, and Grandma was playing with Benji to keep him entertained while lunch was getting ready. So Grandma was tossing the ball to Benji, and Benji had his little plastic bat, and he was going to play baseball with Grandma, and Grandma tossed the ball to Benji, and Benji swung and missed. So Grandma patiently went over and picked up the ball and tossed it to him again, and Benji swung and he missed again. And Grandma very, and this happened time after time. Grandma patiently tossing the ball, Benji's missing the ball. After about 15 swings, Benji had had enough. He said, Grandma, you missed again. You missed my bat again. You ever feel like everybody's missing your bat? Do you see where the problem might be? Jesus said, "My peace, the world doesn't give you peace. You get peace from the God of peace. You get peace from the God of peace. And Paul said, if you want to have peace, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So God is the God of peace and he is the source of peace. And if we know the Lord, the second thing I would say to us today is we are to strive to be peacemakers. We are to be peacemakers makers, not peace breakers. We are to be peacemakers. In fact, if, if, if there's a conflict going on in your life between you and some other person, may I just say, if you, if you know Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, and there's conflict between you and somebody else, it's your move. It's your move. We're to be peacemakers. You say, where do you get that, preacher? Uh, out of the Bible. <laughs> In fact, I get it out of the Sermon on the Mount. I started to tell you I'm going to preach the best sermon that's ever been preached today. But I'm going to just reference the best sermon that's ever been preached, and that's the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught that sermon on a hillside overlooking the shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, but he talks about people that are blessed, uh, joyful. Joyful are those. Joyful. Exceedingly blessed are those. And he has what's called the Beatitudes, and there's nine of them. And how blessed, how, joy, how filled with joy you will be if it's this way. And one of the Beatitudes is this, Matthew 5, 9. Blessed, extremely fulfilled and joyful are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the sons of God. Now can you connect the dots here? God's the God of peace. God's the one that ought to be offended with us. Anybody ought to be offended and absolutely ticked off. It ought to be God because of you and me. And yet God, instead of being offended, pursued us, came after us, sent Jesus into this world, and, 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 and can be the source of peace when we come to know Jesus. And so Jesus then comes and he says, 
Listen, I'm going to give you a little insight. Joyful are peacemakers. Now, that doesn't seem obvious because if there's a lack of peace, there's a need for peacemakers. But these people are joyful because they're making peace. They're looking, they're doing all they can to foster peace. They're, they're peacemakers, not peace breakers. I was amazed at something this week. I don't think I've ever done this before, but I did a study on the word peace in the Bible. I've got a computer program that will bring up uh, topics. And I brought up peace, and here's what I discovered. I don't think I, I knew this. Thirteen books in the New Testament were written by the Apostle Paul. I knew that. They were letters that Paul wrote to people or churches. And every one, every one of those 13 letters, all 13 of them, begin with an idea of peace. That's what Paul leads with. That's what, that's, that's, that was his lead into what he had to say. Now, let me just give you an example. Here, here we go. You ready? Y'all ready? Romans 1, 7. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Romans. What's the next letter Paul wrote? 1 Corinthians. It's in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 1, 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He wrote another letter to the Corinthians. We call it 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 1, 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Next letter in our Bibles is Galatians. Galatians 1, 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Are y'all picking up on a trend here? The next in our Bible is Ephesians. Ephesians 1, 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm not going to read all the others, but it's in Philippians. It's Philippians 1, 2. It's in Colossians 1, 2. 1 Thessalonians 1, 1. 2 Thessalonians 1.2, 1 Timothy 1.2. Paul, Paul expands it in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 1.2, grace, mercy, and peace. <laughs> and then Titus 1.4, Philippians 1.3. All of these, peace. You see, this, this really resonates with the people of God. It always has. If you go, if you go to what we used to call the Holy Land, or Israel. If you ever get to go, I would encourage you to go. And you'll want to go to the holy city in Israel. Now, it's not the, uh, it's just recently, uh, there's, a, there's a struggle about what is the capital of Israel, Tel Aviv, or most Christians and Jews would like to say Jerusalem, right? That's where you want to go. You want to go to Jerusalem. And uh, do you know what the, wor the word Jerusalem means? It means city of peace. Salem, Salam, is the Hebrew word peace. And if you ever go to Israel, if you ever go to Jerusalem and you pass folks on the street, they don't greet one another by saying good morning. They don't greet one another by saying what's up. They don't greet one another by saying how are you. You know how they greet each other in Israel? They say shalom. It comes from that word Salem. They greet one another as may God's peace rest on you when you greet. And then when you leave, may God's peace rest upon you. And if you ever talk with a Jew, they'll say, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Peace is just a part of who the people of God have always known God to be. And so here Paul, as he was writing to the early church, was continuing that theme with this idea that we are to be bestowers of peace. We're to be peacemakers. And Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if you're a peacemaker, you're going to stand out. You're going to be, you're going to be different. You're going to stand out. And uh, people will notice that you're different. And they'll even say, that guy, that gal, she's, she's, she's like God, because God's the God of peace. That must be a child of God. That must be a daughter of God. And that peacemaking can be very contagious. I mean, it can be wonderful. Peace breaking can also be contagious. But what if we were to change that cycle and let it be peacemaking? I, 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 live, with a, I live with a peacemaker. That's why God had her marry me, okay? My wife is precious, but she won't fight. It frustrates the fire out of me. Have you ever tried to fight with somebody that just won't fight? Uh, I'll, I'll 
you know, I'll, I'll do something or say something and she'll smile. Her parents named her Joy. They named her the absolutely perfect name. She, smile, she smiles in her sleep. And I say, of course she does. She's married to me. <laughs> but have you ever been around somebody that's a peacemaker? They're a delight. It's not frustrating. It's a delight to be around a peacemaker in contrast to a peace breaker. You know, some people, you, they'll fight at the drop of a hat. And if they have to, they'll drop the hat. <laughs> and that's why we're to be peacemakers. And, and Jesus said, you'll be joyful if you're a peacemaker. You'll be blessed if you're a peacemaker. And, and folks are going to notice it. And you won't call yourself this. They'll call you a child of God. So God is the God of peace. God's the source of peace. We're to be peacemakers. And how do we do that? We are to pursue peace. We're to pursue peace. And that means you need to have a strategy. Eugene Peterson, the pastor whose quote I read this morning, I thought it was an incredible, helpful definition of worship. Worship is a strategy. It's a strategy whereby we interrupt preoccupation with ourselves and we attend to the presence of God. I just love that. But it's a strategy to do that. You don't drift into worship. You have a strategy to do that. You come in here and put away your phone unless, unless your Bible app is on your phone. Okay? You're not on Facebook. You're not texting. Put all that aside. You've got a strategy. You're here to worship. here to focus. I will tell you, during the music, I'm sitting over here, I'm singing. I don't know if you ever look at me, Janine. I'm, I'm not going over my notes. I'm singing. That's worship. And I'm glad to see our musicians out here. They're worshiping during this part. We're, 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 we're focusing on Him. And so we're to pursue, we're to have a strategy to pursue peace. Here's another way the Bible tells us to do this. This is Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, 14 and 15, it says, Pursue peace with all people. Pursue it. Run after it. And the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. And see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. Now let me just read that again. This is Hebrews 12, 14 and 15. Pursue peace with all people and the sanctification that's being set apart for God without which no one will see the Lord and see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many be defiled. We're to be set apart for God's holy purpose. And that means set apart from what the world does and set apart to do it God's way. If you're going to be a peacemaker and if you're going to pursue the things that are a peace, that's, that's, that's counterculture. That's not the way the world operates. But we're to be set apart. The idea of sanctification, it doesn't mean you're, it doesn't mean you're all perfect. It doesn't mean uh, sinless perfection. Uh, uh, I love Adrian Rogers, my favorite preacher, used to say, you'll never be able to live a life above sin. You'll never be able to live above sin. He, and then he jokingly said, the only way you'll be able to live above sin is if you have an apartment over a liquor store. That's the only way you'll live above sin. So none of us are perfect. We're all a work in progress, but we're to be set apart. What does that mean? We're to be set apart from the world, set apart for God's special purpose. And the best analogy I know of this is my toothbrush. I have a sanctified toothbrush. It's not gold-plated. I didn't get it in Israel. I got it at either the Walgreens or the Walmart, probably, okay? But it's set apart. You know what? It's set apart for me. If you come to my house and go into the restroom and come out and say, Brother Mark, I borrowed your toothbrush, you know what I would say? I would say, that's fine. Why don't you just keep it? Because <laughs> I have a set apart toothbrush. How many, let me show of hands, how many of you have a set apart toothbrush? What does that mean? It's set apart 
from everything else for you. That's what you are to be. That's what I am to be. We're to be set apart from the way the world does it. I know that's the way the world does it. I know that's the way the world reacts. But it says, pursue peace with all people and the sanctification. And don't let a root of bitterness spring up within you. Are you bitter? Are you bitter? Life can make you bitter. But it says, pursue peace and and be set apart so that no root of bitterness springs up. And it causes trouble and you'll defile others. And so we're to pursue peace. Peacemaking is contagious. Peace breaking is too. And then finally, we're to build up one another. That's what he says here in this verse of Romans. Listen to it again. So then, pursue the things that make for peace. And and it's intentionally vague here. It's intentionally vague. Pursue the things that make for peace. So, I've got, a, I've got homework for you, homework assignment. You ready? I want you this week to ask, God, what are some things I can do this week that will make for peace? And, and I mean, write it down. What are some things that I can do? It's intentionally vague here so the Holy Spirit can show you what it is. What are some things I can do that will make for peace? That's what it says to do. So we pursue the things that make for peace and then, and the building up of one another. What is that? That means that we don't just stop fussing, we start blessing. We we are not reactive to problems, we are proactive to how to build up each other. Last week we were in Galatians chapter 6, yeah, chapter 6, about bearing one another's burdens. And in that passage in Galatians 6.10 it says, So we have opportunity, let's do good to all people and especially to those that are of the household of faith. And it's, let, me give you, let me give you a real quick little word lesson. This will bless you. That word back over there in Galatians 10, do good to all those that are of the household of faith. That word household is oikos and it means the household or the family of God. So we're to do good to the oikos. That's a a word that every seminary student learns. Oikos ministry means ministry to the family of God. So Galatians 6.10, stay with me now. This is worth it. Let us do good to the oikos, to the household of God. And here we are now in Romans, the next Sunday, Romans 14.19, says we pursue the things that make for peace and the building up of one another. And the word building here is the same word in the verb form. It's the verb form of oikos. So what he's saying is we're to build up the household. In fact, it's it's almost the idea of building. You think of the church as the building. The church is not the building. The church is the household. It's the family. And so like you would build this church building, like you would build a, a building for the glory of God, or you would want to take good care of the church building. We're going to have a work day, I think, next Saturday, where we want to take care of the building and grounds. And, and, and we should do that. We want to attend to it. We want to, we want to improve it. We want to build it up. That's the exact same thing he's saying here to do. We're to do that with the household of God, with the family of God. So it doesn't mean stop fussing and hush and be quiet. That's not what it means. Some people will hush and be quiet and they'll pout. But it says, no, build up. Build up the family of God. So today, we're to build up one another. We're to seek ways to build up each other. Joy and I, I guess it was about, it was eight years ago, about this time of year, we went to Korea. I was on a sabbatic from the seminary and my sabbatic proposal was to go to Korea, South Korea, and help develop the Doctor of Ministry program for our seminary there. I directed the program here, and so we went to South Korea. We had a wonderful time, and it was a little bit scary, because you're right there at the North Korea border. And on the way to the, to the airport, I asked our driver, where is North Korea? He said, you see those tree, that tree line right over there to the right? I said, yes, sir. He said, that's, those trees are in North Korea. That's how close we were to North Korea. And so we're not fighting them right now, but they're not our friend. They're our enemy. 
We are at, we are at odds with North Korea. We're not fighting right now, but just because we're not fighting doesn't mean they're our friend. Um, our driver asked us to pray for him. He said, we're getting ready to go to Japan and we're going to be missionaries to the Japanese people. And he said, please pray for us. And I didn't know this. He said, because the Korean people hate the Japanese people. They, they, they treated us horribly in World War II. They committed atrocious war crimes in China and Korea. The Japanese did. And uh, he said, my family and I will be leaving next year. We're going to be missionaries to the Japanese people. And he said, God has changed my heart. Those people that used to be our enemies now are the objects of our love and our ministry. Um, we've got conflict over there in Europe right now. And some of the folks that were wanting to rally with us to stop that evil are people that used to be our enemies. Germany, they were our enemies in World War II. They're our, they're our allies now in NATO. Italy, they were our enemies in World War II. They're now our allies. Russia used to be our ally in World War II. Now they're our enemy. And so you've got to pursue this. You've got to pursue the things that make for peace. If nations can do that, if nations can learn how a former enemy can be a friend, Surely God's children can do that. Surely God's children can do that. And if a holy, righteous God who we offended, we offended Him by our sin, can take the initiative to pursue us, and we experience that grace... Do you understand how if we, if we are dispensers of that grace, people will say, that, that guy must be a Christian. To see how he was treated, how she was treated. And they moved on and they are a dispenser of grace. That is the work of God. I've got a dear friend, one of my closest friends at New Orleans Seminary, is a man named Jim. Jim Parker is an is a archaeologist. He's a world-renowned archaeologist. He does archaeological digs in Israel. He teaches Old Testament and Hebrew. He's also a longtime pastor like me. You know, do you remember about 25 years ago, you may remember hearing about there were church burnings in Alabama. There were a number of churches that were burned, about six of them that were burned to the ground. And I was living in Alabama during that time. And a lot of people at a distance maybe jumped to some conclusions and thought, Maybe it was white people burning black churches, or maybe it was black people burning white churches. After all, it is Alabama. And, and we think those people really need Jesus, right? But it was, it was white. When they finally found out what it was, it was three white college students from, a very, from wealthy families at one of the prestigious schools in Alabama burning mostly white churches. And one of the churches they burned was pastored by my friend Jim Parker. And these three drunk college students, one Saturday night, decided it'd be fun to go burn a church. And they burned down Jim's church. And of course they were devastated. And the police were brought in. And the students were arrested. And they were sentenced because of their crime. And they went to prison. And Jim, who was devastated, and his church was devastated because of what these boys had done, went to the prison and led two of those three boys to Jesus. But it didn't stop there. He visited them every month and took them through Bible training and discipleship. And when they got out of prison, they came back to Jim's church and stood before the church and begged for forgiveness. See, that's building up. They rebuilt their building, but Jim built, rebuilt those lives. I mean, that could have destroyed him. That could have destroyed the members of that church. So angry and bitter over what had happened to them. But I use, I'll use Jim Parker as a hero to me of what it means to build up. Pursue peace. Build up one another. And so I don't know all of your stories. 
You don't know all of mine. But let's just go ahead and agree, we both got stories. Right? Say you right. Say you right. We all got stories. But our story is his story. What Jesus Christ did for us. He pursued you. He came into this world to pursue you. And to break down the barrier that existed between you and a holy God by nailing our offenses to the cross. He pursued you. Today. He did that before you were even born. Before you even sinned, he died for your sins. He pursued you. And he, he is wooing you to give your heart to him so he can forgive you. And that's what it means to know peace with God. The Bible says, therefore, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And when we know that peace, we experience that peace, we can pursue that peace, we can be peacemakers and build up the body of Christ. The Bible says that this is really a big deal. In fact, let me just tell you how big of a deal it is. In 1 Corinthians, now this is strong what I'm getting ready to read to you, so buckle your seatbelt. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 says, Do you not know that you are a temple? I'm not talking about this building. You're a temple, and the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you. I'm talking about y'all. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Somebody put it this way, easily translated, church wreckers God will wreck. This is big. This is just big. And so, yeah, Brother Mark preached on the one another's. And, okay, whatever. No, this is, real, this is, this is, this is meets us where we live. Because we're members of one another. And we're to pray for one another. And we're to love one another. And we're to forgive one another. And we're to bear one another's burdens. And we're to serve one another. And we're to build up one another for the glory of God. I just want to challenge you. I want to, I want to urge you. Pursue. And that's my homework. Now, you can ignore it and go your way, but just would you spend 10 minutes sometime this week with the Lord and ask the Lord, Lord, would you, I'm ready, Lord, give me a list of some things I can do to pursue peace this week, to pursue and foster peace this week. If you do it, be careful. People might accuse you of being a Christian and call you a child. Father, we need you. We're broken. And we live in a broken world and we hurt others and others hurt us. And you say, so then, pursue the things that make for peace. Practice these things. Put them into practice. And the peace of God will settle upon you. And you'll be a peacemaker and folks will call you a child of God, and you'll be blessed. Now, Lord, I pray for anyone here today that needs that peace by being saved. They need Jesus. They may be religious, they may be churchy, or they may have no church background, but they need you, Jesus, because we all do. And so, Lord, if there's someone that needs to be saved today, I pray they would come today and not be ashamed or timid about coming to give their heart to Jesus. And so that we can... I can share with them how they can put their trust in you, Jesus. Lord, I pray for someone or maybe several someones who have trusted you and today they would come publicly and say, I want to stand before the church today to declare that I've given my heart to Jesus and I am not ashamed and I want to go public and I'd like to stand and request baptism to show that I'm a child of God. Or maybe there are others, they've done those things but they need a church home. Or maybe, Lord, there's some of the longtime faithful members of this church, but something's happened. Something's happened. And they just really need to get over it and not live under it, but allow you to give them grace and mercy and peace. And so, Lord, I pray that's probably more of us that need that. And so, Lord, give us your peace. Give us your mercy. Give us your grace. 
and uh, help us, Lord, to be a dispenser and a peacemaker and to truly be your child. So, Father, what does it look like if we build up one another? Give us a picture of that. Let us envision that. And let us see ourselves in that picture. And let us begin practicing those things. Uh, and let us resolve to do that just now. For our good, for your glory, and for the building up of one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.